the thrust of this afternoon section is really to take what we heard and what we learned about best practices and, and what we heard just now and to begin to think about how we bring that home to Nevada and uh, learn how we can take some of those best practices, take some of those experiences, take some of those learnings and interpret them and then implement here in Nevada. So the first of our three sessions is called Planning and Implementation, Making Change Happen, and I would add the words, in Nevada. And it's a bridge, really, between what we heard this morning and implementing here in Nevada, because we're going to ask the th four presenters who presented this morning to come up to the stage. Uh, so we're going to ask um, uh, Ted McAleer, Todd Hardy, Tom Clark, and Mike Rosa to join us up here. And, and then we're going to ask three people involved in activities of uh, private industry and, and uh, uh, public uh, activities uh, in particular. Uh, they range all over the place because we've got a terrific group of people uh, that I'm going to introduce now and ask them to start coming up to the stage. And then I'll introduce the moderator. So the first person that will join us up here is Michelle Erlock. Uh, the Director of Corporate Communications for Sierra Nevada Corporation. And Michelle, if you'll make your way up here along with Don Snyder, the Chairman of the Board of the Smith Center for uh, the Performing Arts and the Interim Dean of the UNLV College of Hotel Administration, former Boyd Executive, uh, former Banking Executive, gave me a loan in 1988 to build the casino in Laughlin. I've loved them ever since. Um, <laughs> And uh, thank you. And uh, Don's uh, joined up here finally by Michael Yakira, the president and CEO of NV Energy and somebody that I have a great pleasure of working with uh, every day. And finally, uh, because we're bridging this morning's presentation uh, with this afternoon's thrust, uh, we have a bridge builder. Uh, and this person sort of literally is a bridge builder, and that's Steve Hill. Um, because Steve is the uh, uh, Vice President and General Manager of Cal Portland Company, very active leader in this community, and um, very active, I think, both on the business front and on the uh, business leadership front, and also, of course, a member of the Governor's Transition Team uh, for Governor Brian Sandoval. And Steve, thank you very much for leading today's session, and I'll ask our four other panelists from this morning or presenters from this morning to please join us up here. Thank you. Well, thanks for that, Phil. Um, I appreciate everyone being here. I appreciate everyone in the audience being here. Um, it, it, I was talking to Rob Lang uh, a couple of days ago about what he expected out of this hour, and he told me that he expected that I keep you awake for the hour so that we can hear what the elected officials have to say. Uh, so I'm going to try and do that after lunch. Uh, we're going to move pretty quickly. Uh, I'd like, we've got a lot of great people on this panel. We only have an hour to hear from them. Uh, we want to open the uh, some of the time toward the end of this session uh, to the audience. So I would like you to be thinking about questions that you'd like to uh, hear answered. Um, you know, we heard a lot of great things this morning. I think everybody will agree, um, no matter what your level of um, effort has been or experience has been in economic development, certainly you'll learn something this morning. Um, one of the things that uh, the, the group that uh, put this conference on wanted to make sure uh, is that we don't leave today thinking, boy, we sure would be like these, like to be like these folks and not know what we need to do in order to do that. Um, we, we've talked a lot and we need vision in this state. Uh, the Vision Stakeholder Group has laid that out. The Nevada Task Force has laid some of that out. Um, we know where we want to go. 
we need to also know how to get there. We need to know what we need to expect in this next legislative session, what we are trying to accomplish over the next year, over the next two years, as we step toward uh, achieving that 20-year vision. Um, you know, we heard today about the role of education in the economy. Uh, we heard some great things about the USTAR program that's uh, become relatively famous in, in uh, education circles. Uh, I think Dr. Smostros will tell you it is one of the ways that we can actually make progress quickly. Uh, it produces a great result with relatively little investment, uh, primarily because the state has already uh, invested in the infrastructure uh, that was talked about in the USTAR program. Um, we heard about uh, how Arizona State makes an impact uh, in Arizona. Uh, we want to broaden the discussion a little bit. I, I hope somebody asks, or if not, uh, you can comment. Uh, the Brookings um, report that came out just a couple of days about state budgets, uh, we need to talk about how do we deal with the situations we have given the current economy, the current budget situation. Uh, Arizona's facing a very similar situation. What's, what's going to happen uh, with those programs at Arizona State, how do you handle those situations going forward? What advice would you have for Nevada? Uh, that's important. Um, we, we heard great things from Dallas and the diversity there. Uh, we heard that um, they feel like uh, that region is almost like a state, uh, which seems pretty appropriate since Texas feels like it's almost like a country. Um, <laughs> but um, we, we learned uh, how they can capitalize on an airport, how they can diversify that region. Uh, we also heard from our friend Tom Clark how they recovered, how they collaborated, which is really important, something that, that Rob brought up, something we heard about this morning. Uh, we heard about the different definitions of clusters. Uh, what, 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 what Tom doesn't know, um, and he's been here a fair amount, he's uh, allowed me some time with him, uh, we have actually recruited him to help Nevada. We just aren't paying him for it. So we, we, we appreciate all the help and we appreciate the time here. Um, at some point in, uh, in this program, someone uh, is probably going to thank all the people involved. Uh, as kind of an outsider, but able to see uh, the planning that went in, uh, along uh, and all the hard work, I'd like to point out two people uh, before we get uh, into a conversation. Uh, Jerry Bamati and Nancy Flagg from UNLV put in a tremendous amount of effort. Um, And it, it, it takes a lot uh, to put a program like this together, and there were a lot of people involved. Um, but I, I thought those two in particular um, may have flown under the radar a little bit and really deserved uh, our thanks for, for putting this together. Um, the way we're going to do this, uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to ask um, our new panelists, uh, those from Nevada, to um, give briefly uh, some observations that they saw from this morning. Uh, if they have a question for one of our panelists, start the questioning. Uh, I'd like to move pretty quickly. Uh, I'd like to give as many people a chance to get involved in this conversation. Um, I'd like to break through a little. I mean, I'd, I'd like, as you're sitting out there listening for the next three hours, everyone here is interested in economic development. What I don't want you to do is walk away and say, I wonder what they are going to do about it. Uh, we all need to do something about economic development. And I think, I can't imagine that everyone here doesn't have a role. Um, I would, I'd like to think about how we gather those thoughts. Uh, I don't know if we have a mechanism in place. I think we need to get a mechanism in place. Uh, and I'd also like the expert panelists that we have to think about as we get toward the end of this hour, if you have one or two recommendations for what we should do next, now during this legislative session over the next couple of months, what would you recommend? So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Michelle. I was glad to see that you made it up the steps. She had a little bit of a tear in her leg, so we're, we're happy that you're safe up here. Michelle? Thank you, Steve. Um, I think one of the observations um, that I would make is is if we looked at Nevada as a corporation as Nevada Inc. and we were all members of that corporation, I think one of the concerns or one of the focuses that you always want to have is the collaboration and then everybody's working for the whole. And what I'd be like be interested in hearing from the panel is how did they get everyone to work together as a whole, not go ahead and focus on their individual interests. 
even within uh, your own corporation, we have seven divisions at Sierra Nevada Corporation, and, and, and each one of those divisions has an independent interest. We've got aerospace, you've got um, you know traffic control, you have communications, we're getting to solar, but, but we've been able to have a common vision so everyone works together. And I, I guess I would, if I could ask a question of, um, say, Tom Clark, how did, how did they keep the motivation and how did they, how did you keep, whether it's the private industry or the, or the political um, climate, working together? And I thought one of the things that um, the Lieutenant Governor said that um, the politics that the Republicans, Democrats, and all the parties were reaching across, across the aisle I thought was, was comforting. So let's, let's assume that we have that in place. Um, how do you move after that? Tom? That was oh. Well, the answer pretty, became pretty simple to us. It didn't start out very simply. It was trying to think if we could herd all the cats together somehow, uh, everybody would love each other. Um, it didn't work that way. Uh, what it result, the, the basic takeaway for us, and what we've used it uh, with, with great success over the years, is somebody has to bring the checkbook. And there has to actually be money in the account. Uh, and, and you write checks to do things to bring people together. And at the university level, uh, and no offense to the university, I will quote another college president, but I won't give his name because you'll all be mad at him. But when he referred to the deans to me one time as we were walking in to try to sell this idea to the deans, he said, welcome to medieval times. And, <laughs> and what he did was the same thing we did, is we put the incentive above the existing structures to get people to collaborate, and that incentive was money. Uh, and so for the local economic development programs around the region who were afraid that the central office, which was our shop, was going to go out and take all their dollars away from them, we actually became the largest investor in their programs for the first three years, giving them a substantial amount of money to make sure they could stay in place because we needed them to be in place. We couldn't get a delivery system. Ultimately, they needed us to be able to do the national and international marketing because we had one brand, and that brand was Denver. It didn't have a lot of cooties on it. It wasn't a great brand, but it didn't, wasn't really bad. And, and, and we enhanced that brand over time. Uh, but it, it pretty much came down to, to, to cash and to not necessarily buy into the structures that have historically competed for resources with one another, but to put money up above them to get them to collect and make the price of that entrance, uh, 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 the price of that uh, of such a magnitude that they would be willing to collaborate as a condition of getting the money. Tom, when you, you, when you went through the, the principles and negotiated that, uh, was that a difficult process? Did that happen pretty quickly? Is that something you'd recommend that we do soon? I would recommend that you do it very quickly. It is, it is a time-consuming process. Uh, I would suggest that two or three people be prepared to gain about 15 or 20 pounds <laughs> because they're going to do a lot of breakfast uh, and have a lot of conversations and listen more than talk. Uh, to what people, what troubles them about the structure, whether or not they feel they're getting a fair shake. Um, very much a servant leader kind of, of model. But, but we were astounded at how many historic problems just disappeared once everybody signed. And, and don't underestimate the power of ceremony in something like that. We had, uh, I told Steve this story, but we had, a, we had the mayor of Denver and the mayor of Aurora, which is the adjacent city, and the mayor of Aurora had built his mall right on the border of Denver. And when asked by the local papers why he'd done it, he said, I did it to steal all the sales tax from Denver. Now, this is not a collaborative model, OK? <laughs> so the day we got ready to sign the principles of agreement, and we had all these mayors and the economic development people, and we had risers out, and we had the purple ropes, we had the Colorado Children's Corral singing God Bless America. And I'm not kidding. And, and the governor was the first one to sign. And then the two mayors came down and signed simultaneously. And that sent a message throughout the state that the days of economic warfare were over. And, and in the two papers the next morning, it says, economic armistice signed. <laughs> and uh, that was the big, that, that, that ceremony, the power of that ceremony had huge symbolic impact on where we were able to go from there. Great. Don? Please. 
Very good. Thank, thanks, Dave. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to see the crowd that we have, not only the numbers of people, but really who's here today. This is, this is really one of the more impressive collections of people that I've seen in my 23 years coming together to talk about something that uh, is truly important uh, for our state. Uh, I, I'd also like to add my thanks to, to these uh, speakers uh, who are here. Uh, they clearly uh, have a perspective from, uh, that comes from having been there uh, and done that. It's probably also uh, clear that maybe uh, we, we don't pose too much of a threat uh, to them uh, when it comes to uh, uh, challenging some of the things that they've built uh, over the years. But they, they truly have been there and done that. And I think from the presentations this morning, uh, we clearly uh, uh, have seen some things that, uh, that we can learn from. Uh, we need uh, in our state to get uh, beyond the been there. Uh, we, are, we have been there, we are, uh, we are here now. We've managed to dig ourselves a pretty deep hole because we haven't uh, spent the time, done what was necessary uh, over the last uh, 20 years or so, kind of repositioning uh, this economy. The, uh, the conversations that have taken place, I've been here for 23 years and have uh, participated one way or another uh, in a lot of conversations about uh, the type of things that we're talking uh, about here today. Uh, the need to change, the need to, uh, to look at our, our, uh, our structure, the structure of this state to have a more broadly based uh, economy. Uh, and it's been very difficult uh, to uh, get serious about that. I mean, I, I've read every study that's been done. If you, if you go back and, and read the study that was done by Price Waterhouse in 1989, uh, it's like it could have been uh, uh, written uh, yesterday, talking about the, some of the structural things, some of the things that are challenging us today with regard to an economy that isn't working the way that it, uh, that it needs to and, and will not support uh, what we need to be uh, going forward. Uh, Senator Horsford's comment when he quoted a statement out of uh, the Vision Stakeholders Group when he said that uh, quality of life is a hollow promise uh, if you don't have uh, a, a strong, uh, vibrant, and sustainable economy uh, is, is absolutely true. So the things that we're talking about uh, are, are critically uh, important, uh, but how we get there is, is really the challenge. I mean, I've said in so many of these type of uh, uh, sessions uh, over the years, and we talk about the need to do it, but we just don't find the way uh, to actually do it. And, and I think that uh, to a considerable extent, it's because we had a pretty vibrant economy here for a long time. I remember as a banker, and, and Phil alluded to the fact that uh, I was a banker before I got into the gaming business and, and, and now into uh, academia. So I've had a chance to, to, to see uh, what goes on here from a, from a few different uh, uh, perspectives. But the thing uh, uh, that, that strikes me is that uh, when, uh, when things are going really well, it's, it's hard to take the time uh, to, uh, to change. Uh, I spoke as a banker to people and talked about uh, this economy and how we're, if we're not recession proof, uh, we're recession resilient. Uh, and I think that we've now demonstrated that perhaps uh, uh, the, uh, the world has, has changed a little bit. So we need to find a way to deal with this. When uh, the economy, I, I used to take great pride in, in, in talking about uh, the state that I lived in when people would say, uh, you, you live in Nevada or you live in Las Vegas uh, with a, a certain am amount of amazement. I, I would take great pride in whatever time frame it happened to be to say that, well, did you know that uh, for the last 18 years, Nevada's been the fastest growing uh, community in America, or state in America? Uh, and that, uh, uh, that was something that we could take great pride in. That's something that's been taken away from us right now, and I think we all, we all should take that pretty uh, uh, personally and say that uh, now is the time for us to get uh, beyond this been there stage and get to, uh, get to the stage where we can say that we've done it, as, uh, as these four gentlemen uh, have shared with us uh, here today. Uh, we have a lot to do, and it's easier not to, to deal uh, with these type of things. Uh, it is tough finding the right way to uh, sort through and, and collaborate and do the things that, are, that we've heard about today that are going to be important uh, to get uh, the job done. Uh, but we, uh, uh, as Tom uh, pointed out when he quoted Forbes magazine, uh, we can't afford to waste a, a good recession. Uh, if there's uh, ever a time uh, when we need to get serious, now's the time. And, and, uh, and uh, if there's anything, I said in an earlier uh, meeting that we had a few weeks ago, and, and, and Tom used that quote, I said if there's anything worse uh, than wasting a good recession, it's wasting a, a, a period of uh, 20 years of, uh, of vitality when we per perhaps could afford to do some of the things that now we, ha we have to do. Uh, but uh, when you're, uh, when you're, it's, it's like uh, the analogy that I've used on a few occasions, it's like if you're driving a car 90 miles an hour, 
uh, and everything seems to be going fine. It's hard to change the tires when that's going 90 miles an hour. But, uh, but now we have, a, we have a chance to pause, to reflect, to learn perhaps from some others and uh, find a, a path to the future. Thanks, Don. Uh, Michael? Thanks, Steve. It's also uh, expressed my uh, great pleasure to be here, and it's an honor to, to, uh, to be part of this group. Um, I can't help but analogize uh, to a business setting where when you're uh, working on a strategic plan, you look at what's happening in the environment, you look at what the critical success factors are for being successful within the industry that you choose to be in or the environment that you have, and you stack up the things that you do well or the things that differentiate you to see how you compare to those critical success factors so you can see where you can focus. It seems to me that there is a variety of ways that these uh, individuals have, have demonstrated or explained how you can be successful at this, whether it be through the university system or, or USTAR or what Denver has done. Um, there isn't a cookie cutter approach to it. However, there needs to be a visionary or a vision, I think. And, you know, I'm, I'm rather new. I'm not 23 years here. I'm only eight years here this month, in fact. Uh, but this is my home, and this is where I'm going to be for the rest of my life, and I love it, and Nevada is just an incredible place to be. I think Don is right that when you're going gangbusters, you don't want to necessarily change anything. And it, it's sometimes, it, it almost feels overwhelming when you're faced with the kind of crisis that we're faced with to say, oh my goodness, what is it that we're going to do to change this? But the, the other analogy that I think about is, um, and, and using my industry as an example, more than 20 years ago we were talking about electric cars. And the reason that we stopped looking at electric cars or we, we stopped the development of renewable energy was that oil prices came down. We were all so fearful that oil prices were going to be at $140 a barrel a couple of years ago that we were saying that renewable energy and electric cars were the way we were going to go. We need to, we need to as a country, we need to as a state, take the opportunity to say, I'm not going to suggest that depending upon what is happening specifically in a given economic downturn, I'm going to either shy away from something that's difficult to do or say, I'm going to leave it to the next person. Because it cannot happen overnight. This is, this is something that is a, a march that it's going to take a while to do. I, I'm probably being very convoluted here because I do have a question to ask, and that is, <laughs> Was there an, uh, a necessary vision? And Bugsy Siegel, right? He saw Las Vegas as being a, the, the capital, the mecca of, uh, of gaming. Um, rightly or wrongly, you know, you can, you can debate who that was and what the vision was, but at the end of the day, it was the right vision. And sometimes, uh, I think uh, Thomas Watson said, um, as long as you're going forward, that's okay. When you're standing still, no progress is death. Um, we have to move forward. What or how did a vision come about to say, and let's take Dallas as an example. How did a vision come about to say, this is the right time and the right opportunity for us so that you can look back 20 years later and say it was a success? It was a success. You, the, the, vision that comes to, the vision that comes to my mind is what took place uh, back in the late 60s and early 70s when, uh, you know, you had Dallas, City of Dallas had an airport, Love Field. City of Fort Worth also had an airport, Eamon Carter Field, and it was actually located just south of where DFW Airport is today. And uh, those two cities, uh, for anyone that uh, knows of Texas history a little bit, were always cats and dogs a little bit. Fort Worth, uh, where I live, incidentally, uh, still today, uh, always feeling a little bit... Uh, like a little brother or a little sister to, to Big D and so forth and so on. You have examples of that all over the country. But when those two cities finally realized that here we are in the, you know, on a flat featureless prairie uh, in a great, the great state of Texas, right? But still with, with not all that many reasons for corporate America to come find you, uh, we need to do something about it. 
And when they got together and made the, the handshake, the paperwork, the signatures that launched DFW International Airport at the time and was having a great conversation over lunch, I see you there, someone spent years with Delta Airlines all over the country and came up to me and was talking about DFW. Uh, it was poked fun at at that time, saying, "Why in the world would you build such a big airport out in the you know way out between these two cities? It's 17 miles from either Dallas or Fort Worth to even get to the airport. It's out in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of nowhere." Uh, and looking back on that, I think to to a person, uh, one interested in economic development would have to say that it's been a huge success and really. You know, one, one of my slides had that increase in corporate headquarters, that spike that took off, mm -hmm. directly a result of that airport. It, it opened up the region, not only to the United States, but also to the world, and, and we feel like it's not good enough today. That's why we're so- May I follow up to that? Because I think, I think you, you've hit something that is, is critical for us. Uh, I live here, and there is a north-south divide. There's no doubt about it. <gasps> yeah, I know. I'm speaking the, I either speaking the obvious or the thing, or the, or the thing you shouldn't talk about. But there, I mean, there clearly is. So we'd, we'd be fooling ourselves if we, if we didn't say that. The coming together of Dallas, Fort Worth, Dallas and, and Fort Worth is similar to. I lived in Tampa, when Tampa and St. Pete both believed that they could attract the baseball team. Each of them did, and it wasn't until they came together and said we can only get one, that they got a baseball team. So is there a suggestion that we should find the things that differentiate the various regions that we have within our state and come together with different plans to say, here's why Elko makes sense. Here's why Henderson makes sense. Rather than being you know, d diverse in terms of, of the way we go about economic development, meaning the, the methodology by which we go about economic development. You know, Texas has that issue too. It's like Nevada, it's a big state. And the construct of incentives and improving the Texas business climate uh, over the past couple of decades has been uh, allowing for that differentiation, allowing for flexibility in the toolkit, uh, allowing for, you know, at the state level, uh, picking areas of emphasis that would appeal and work for different subregions of the state and not just uh, casting down one or two or three. Uh, sort of set in stone types of missions. Uh, it, it has to be flexible for a state of that size with, with so many communities and regions that feel themselves players and independently uh, strong and, and powerful. I just think there's one thing you really talk about brand and uh, how many Springfields are there in the United States? Okay. As one of my friends said, if you're in Springfield, you're nowhere. Uh, I think there are 38 Springfields in the United States. I think what you lose if you, so you have an overarching brand for, for Nevada that I think has to be the common perception. Uh, Colorado has a brand, you know, mountains, skiing, tourism, what have you. Uh, but, but that brand got in the way of our ability to do a business brand, mm -hmm. okay? So we differentiated ourselves from Colorado as from the state. And then within our region, we did not want to stifle creativity, which is if you've got a system that forces everybody into one way of thinking and one way of acting other than to sell the region first and things in the code of ethics I talked about, you lose. And, and, and so we left a lot of flexibility. Some of the counties have very different clusters than the region does. Some of them are logistics-based because they happen to have a high concentration of railroad and trucking. Uh, that ends up them bringing something new to the table and gives a, a, another data-informed mm -hmm. set of decisions for the rest of us. So kind of one plus one plus one equals, you know, ten. Thank you. Steve, uh, let me uh, pose a question to all four uh, of the uh, folks that spoke with us this morning. Uh, and it gets to how do we, where do we go from here? Uh, how do we get out of the discussion phase, the talking phase, the study phase, uh, uh, all the things that uh, we've done multiple times uh, uh, over, uh, over the years. Uh, if you look at what we're doing today, uh, we've had multiple groups uh, come together uh, to talk about uh, uh, these type of things. Tom, you have spoken to two of the groups, counting the one today. Uh, how do we get out of uh, that stage uh, and actually uh, get to the point uh, where uh, we coalesce toward action, that we create some action? Uh, so how do we get there, uh, and, and, and where does the leadership have to come from? Uh, I'd like the, the concept of public sector versus private sector to kind of work into the dialogue, dialogue here. 
Ted, do you want to start? I'd, I'd be happy to take a crack at it. Uh, everybody's got a different situation, but the theme that keeps running through is, is vision. And candidly, I would go one step further and call it the consensus vision. And whether you talk about Dallas and, and Fort Worth, or you talk about Tampa and St. Pete, or in our case in Utah, we were you know trying to get together Salt Lake City's University of Utah and uh, Logan's Utah State University. There's, there's some sacrifice on the vision, right? And uh, the question then becomes who's gonna lead it? And so I, I think you need to take your best ideas that are on the table right now and look for the consensus vision that's good enough to make something get started. And then in terms of leadership, there's two types of leadership that we've talked about. One is human capital, the second is financial capital. And in our particular case, we had a big budget surplus and we were able to take a budget surplus and put it on the table to align the vision. As we a, don't have that here. And, and you don't, <laughs> no. And, but, but what you have is the same thing that, that Cleveland had and that Pittsburgh has. And, and you're not a steel town, I'm not trying to make that comparison, but you have a tremendous amount of wealth that had been generated through the last 20 years. And when Cleveland and Pittsburgh and these other people started on this journey, they didn't lead with the state taxes, they led with the philanthropic community. And the philanthropic community said, here's our contribution, now the state's gotta match it in some way, right? Is it a, you know, $1 from the state for every three from philanthropy? You know, however you decide to do that, but your leadership in terms of the financial capital can come from the businesses that are still thriving and from the individuals that have made a lot of money and are now turning to philanthropy, and they can you know, be the ones, whoever puts that dollar on the table, that gets to have the biggest stake in the consensus vision. I mean, that, that's, that's the way things work. Money talks. We'll jump to the other end. Todd? Well, excuse me. The first thing I think you've got to be mindful of is to be all-inclusive. This is a wonderful event. This is bringing together all the sectors in, in one place to talk about this, and I think you've got to continue in that vein. It's not just one, un one university being involved. It's the university system being involved. It's not just one cluster. It's all the resources and, and strengths that you have here in the state that have to be touched on and, and brought into the conversation and, and furthered. I, I think that after you've done that, though, you've got to think as globally as you possibly can. I don't think if you, if you focus simply on what Nevada can do on its own, with its own strengths, I think you're missing the boat. I think you've got to think in regional terms. I think you've got to think in ways in which our states can work together most effectively, particularly in the energy sector. We need each other in the energy sector. I think you've got to think in those terms strategically. So after you all get together and think as globally as you possibly can about what you can do to uh, diversify your economy and grow the economy here, then the, just two things come to mind. Just do it. You've got to do something. You've got to get out there and do it as quickly as you can as well. You don't have as much time as you think. Let me just follow up with that for a minute. And, and you know, we talked about a vision. We talked about being all inclusive, which I, I think both are important. Um, but I think the terminology matters maybe particularly to our audience. Um, if somebody asked me, and I'm, I'm interested in your opinion, but if somebody asked me, what should we do right now? We should do a sector analysis because we have lots of ideas in the room. We have lots of ideas from panels that have been structured in the past. Um, we have a lot of assets. I'm not sure we could list them all in one place. Uh, but figuring out what to do in the next six months or the next year while we are doing a parallel path of a more inclusive, um, we, we need to be inclusive both ways, but a more inclusive, broader approach that takes time. I mean, it, it takes, uh, I think the Envision Utah project took 18 months, 24 months, um, and we have to do what we are, what we need to do now in respect to the fact that we have 14% unemployment, we have almost 200,000 people in the state who need a job. So is that, does that resonate, Tom? It would with me. Um, you know, we while we were trying to figure out how to write principles of agreement and eventually codes of ethics and all those kinds of things, we were doing cluster studies. Yeah. We hired Dick Celeste out of Ohio, former governor, who at that time was one of the 
his firm was one of the four uh, in the forefront. It wasn't exactly politically laden. It didn't have a lot of political overtones about who got to sit at the table. It was a group of people who wrote a check and said, would everybody agree that we hire Celeste and go out and have him see where the hell our global competitive advantage is and we'll come back and share the data with you in about three weeks. And well, he ran about two months on us, but we, we still got there. In the meantime, it really came down to a question of who do you trust? And it was not institutions that we asked that question of. We asked people in meetings not quite as large as this, but of a couple hundred people, who are the people in the room do you trust to put together a document that we can all respond to? And then you get people who cross all kinds of lines. You know, people who may be in the philanthropic community or like these gentlemen came from the business community, then into academia and who, who are in lots of places that people would be willing to at least entrust them to do a draft that everybody could respond to. And then that, once that draft was done, then it, then it got, very, got very big, uh, resulting in the, the uh, ceremony at the end. And then the bottom part of that, emerging from that, I expect you will get one or two product champions. These are people who will die to get this done and to make it work. And we all know those crazy people. Uh, you know, the guy who was the first chairman of the Greater Denver Corporation years ago will to this day tell you that it was the greatest, most fulfilling civic in, uh, challenge and project of his life. It was, it was the absolute penultimate of his civic life. And by God, he got people see him coming down the street, they'd cross the street to get away from him. I mean, the guy, <laughs> he just couldn't shut him up. But it was that, that passion of a, just a couple of people to draw everybody finally together and, and make it start. Mike? It was interesting to see the reaction of state legislators, political leadership throughout the state, uh, Dallas Fort Worth area, regional leaders, both business leaders and uh, civic leaders. Uh, political leaders. When you show a list of the 10 largest metropolitan areas in the U.S. and the fourth largest one doesn't have a tier one research institution and sometimes and that just had a congealing motivating impact uh, from the local to the regional to the state level and sometimes it can be as simple as putting something down on paper showing where you stand it's irrefutable it's undeniable in both its accuracy and its importance uh, going forward one of one of the the best uh, initiatives we undertook as a chamber was just that simple little matrix that said what you know what will be the what are the features of 10 or 20 years from now 30 years from now a truly global region I mean, the world is flat, but the world is also spiky. There are spikes on that flat surface. We want to be one of those spikes. We have been, but what do we need to do to be one of those spikes in the future? And when we looked at, you know, we, we, we always felt that we, we stood pretty strong when, it, when compared against United States regions, okay? But when we open it up and we're honest as a region and honest with our study, we realize that when it comes to the world, we've got a lot of work to do. And we were fortunate in the fact that a couple of, you know, the, uh, you know, if you believe that technology and advanced services and human capital and being able to get to and from a place globally is important to drive, uh, to, to become a global region, if you, if you subscribe to that, uh, and, and we do, when we looked at the action items and our weaknesses, they, there were only a, a few that came out of that state. They were big. They were huge. Tier one university more direct flights international but but it was a small enough set we could get our arms around it and engage some action items and so but but from the uh, from the question uh, time frame of that to proving up the uh, the evidence to releasing and communicating the work publicly and through the private sector in the region you know get all that through and coming out with just a couple of things a couple of strengths you can play off of a couple of weaknesses that you must address today. That's the way to do it. Or else you'll be like that uh, person that stands at the table of six jam jars and 24 mm -hmm. jam jars. It's hard enough for one person to pick the jam. Imagine if all the people in this room had to come to consensus on which jam to buy, or one or two or three jams. Much easier to work at that six jam table than that 24 jam table. Great. We're, we're going to open it up.
uh, to questions. In just a minute, I'm going to ask the one I alluded to earlier. All of our states in the country obviously has, has some budgetary problems. Um, some of the work I think that you folks have done uh, have uh, allowed your states to not suffer as significantly uh, as Nevada uh, and maybe as Arizona. Um, and, I, and I'd like to ask, uh, how, how do you see Arizona dealing with uh, their budget shortfall in relation to the work that you've done and how that will impact the, the state university system, community colleges there, um, and what would you recommend that, that we do going forward? Uh, we've already dealt with um, some significant cuts uh, from the state in the last couple of years. Our new governor is, is going to come out with her new proposed budget in a few days, and we'll see where that takes us and more cuts are expected. Uh, the way we've dealt with it in the past is to, like any good business would, is to try to, try to slim down and eliminate some duplication where it might have existed. Unfortunately, jettison some things that weren't as effective or productive for the overall enterprise in the process. We've gotten to the point where, as, as our university exists today, we are about at the level that we can be with that kind of change. We are at the bone, as they say. Um, so if more cuts are coming, and, and they probably will be coming within the state, we'll, we'll have to adjust. It'll, the question about tuition was telling and sensitive for all universities. Most of our um, investment comes from three sources. Uh, tuition monies, about a third of our budget, the state is an investor, as we like to call them, of about 25% of our budget, and research makes up about 20% of what we use and bring in. Um, so if the state's investment is reduced, then we'll have to look at things like increasing our research endeavors. And as I said at the conclusion of my remarks, our president has so kindly more than doubled our target over the next 10 years for research, and it's our job to figure out how to do that. We will bring in those dollars that'll help um, we'll have to look at tuition probably somewhere down the line, but that's a policy matter that we'll have to discuss as soon as we see what the state wants to do. I think some of the things we also learned, though, as we went through this in the last couple of years, is that you have to get the message out as a community, not just as a university. You've got to let the community know how important the kinds of things are that we've talked about today, how economic development can be driven through public-private partnerships involving universities. And once the public understands that, they can come to the forefront too and participate. I don't know what the, the vehicles are within the state of Nevada for helping ease the budget uh, concerns that you have here in this state, but last time around we, as a community, came to the polls and voted for an increase, a one cent increase in our sales tax to help alleviate some of the deficit within the state of Arizona so that schools did not have to be cut even further. Uh, so I'd say that one thing that w you'd have to consider is not only making the, the case for your strategy going forward, but making sure the community understands how important that is for everyone so you can get as much political support that you can for the most viable budget that you can put forward. Once you get that in place, then I think you've got to, as a university, and my colleagues at the, at the universities here are probably in the same boat, look at whatever you can say, but also look at other, other people's money. If you look at Nevada Inc. as sort of the ship that we're looking at here, You've got to look at ways in which you can attract other people to come in and invest in the state through viable research uh, programs that can, can boost the innovation engine that you have here in the state as well. Questions from the audience? Right here. I'm, I'm going to let you decide who. <laughs> I'm not, not going to take the heat. <laughs> Hi, Terry Williams, the Dorian Corporation. Uh, two questions, one for Tom, and then the second one is for, uh, for uh, Ted. Tom, I'm looking at setting up a branch office in Denver, Colorado. Thank and you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, when looking at the commercial real estate, right now we have about six years worth of um, exorbitancy, about 100 million square feet of vacancy here in Las Vegas. I'm uh, looking at uh, commercial real estate in uh, Denver, about 13 to $15 a square foot. Is that correct? That's for that's for B, B space. You'll be looking at eighteen to twenty one for A. Okay, so we're looking at a dollar twenty five, dollar fifty, class A building here, and you're at thirteen to fifteen dollars. What? Uh, how do you justify that in economic development to attract some of the large scale Fortune five hundred companies that come in? And never. And uh, should I ask the second question for? Um, well, you can ask that. Answer that. 
the way we just the way we justify it is is you're buying more than just a piece of real estate. Typically, real estate is about one percent of an entire transaction. Uh, the trade-off that we ask people to look at is everything from the productivity of being the skinniest state in the country. Uh, those of you who don't know, morbidly obese people are absent from work 34% of the more, more times for uh, obesity-related diseases. We're the skinniest. We're the second most highly educated in terms of baccalaureates, even though people are sending us a lot of smart people. We're going to start charging for commercial time here <laughs> if you're not careful. Hey, I'm now. pitching yeah. this guy. He said he's already thinking about moving. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and we don't try to sell that we're a low price market. Uh, you're, you, most people appreciate the fact that it, is it a value market to me? And it's the same thing with taxes. I always ask people, if you want to look at the states that have the most robust economy, and, and I can show you lots of statistics, don't look for the states who have the lowest taxes. They're not the most robust. Uh, uh, I'm not playing to the crowd here, folks. I'm just telling you the reality of it. Uh, and so if, if you want a decent education system, if you want decent roads, if you want mass transit, those kinds of things come at a cost, but they add to a value of quality of life for your business. And that's the way we make the sale. I cannot compete against Wyoming, okay? I cannot. Uh, they'll send your kids to college for free. They'll, uh, they have huge uh, corporate surpluses, but it's, there's not a lot about Wyoming that makes it a great and desirable place for a corporate headquarters to move. Second question. Second question is for uh, Ted. Ted, a lot of the surrounding uh, states have a incentive for film and production. In the state of Nevada, we do about $100 million a year in film production, but a lot of that post-production goes back to LA. I really uh, advocate as a revenue driver for the state of Nevada that we could probably do about $800 million a year in film and production if we had certain incentives. How did you guys do that in, 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 uh, in Utah? And if there's any other states that did it, how did you do it from an incentive standpoint? Yeah, Terry, I'm probably the last guy to comment on film incentives because everything that I've been reading is that uh, states are giving away more in film incentives than they're getting back in economic development. So I would not advocate film incentives, but, but perhaps I don't understand them well enough other than what I've read that that's not my part of uh, the economic development plan for Utah. So somebody else might be able to answer it better. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the governor, the new governor of uh, Colorado, is very much very much interested in this, and and so he had his policy guys during the whole summer look at all the states who did these kinds of incentives, and so I, I'm, I've always been opposed to him because I agree that they, they, they don't make any economic sense in terms of return to the state. So I asked his head of policy about three weeks ago. I said, "How'd you end up with that film thing?" And he said, "Every state we talked to said, well, it's okay, which of course means it's terrible, and and." Uh, the way you make money in films is you get sound stages, you get post-production units, you get lighting companies, all those things that make the infrastructure up, not just get these one-off kind of productions com coming and, in and filming and, and leaving. And the final piece of that actually could be a core competitive advantage for Nevada. I mean, digital media, right? I mean, you know, film is not the way you used to do it. You find a great location, you go and shoot it. Now it's a bunch of information technology folks that are putting together um, you know these 3d movies and, and it's all about technology and so in Utah we're focused on the digital media industry we've been attracting a lot of digital media companies because they like our information technology workers and they also see a creative element there and and so I don't think we're gonna keep paying out incentives for attracting film locations I think we're gonna start building more of the IT infrastructure that drives the digital media aspect of film yeah. Thanks. Well, I get, <clears throat> I've heard a lot of great things today, and uh, a couple of things that really bring economic development, uh, and that is that you need to have investment, and then you, you need to also eliminate the crippling uh, regulation that sometimes hurts many of the industries. Uh, in the case of uh, entertainment, uh, I agree with the gentleman that uh, it is not just a place where you're going to go and film. Uh, a movie or a television program, but it really it's an all intensive and it's it takes many years I think to develop a, uh, a, a System or an infrastructure so that in fact you will create the revenue dollars and those are very high-paying jobs on the issue of um, 
equipping regulation. I think you have the energy business, you have the mining businesses, which are basically very well stymied uh, in the state of Nevada. So I think. Do you have a question, sir? Yeah, and the question is, is, is the state of Nevada going to be looking at uh, these industries in order to maybe uh, help the economic development? Is, does that, anybody want to pick that one up? I might be, are you asking about uh, what we're going to do in terms of renewable resources and um, coal and, and energy as a general rule and how Nevada has been, been treating that? I guess if that, if that was the question. Um, we're, um, we're working on solar in Nevada actually today, um, at least as a state, we're um, t number one in um, use of federal funding. We use 91% of our federal funding for renewable energy. Um, which is actually pretty impressive as a state that we were able to do that. I think that the renewable energies, geothermal, the solar, wind, are, are um, three of our, our biggest resources right now that we have. I think that um, with uh, the recent, you know, I think the next legislature, I think there's going to be probably a lot of things going on to actually further facilitate uh, those um, renewable energies coming in into Nevada. And I, I think the legislature is um, having we just um, put um, a solar um, three solar sites on the Nevada Guard. They got energized. We're looking at doing more. I, I think you're going to see a lot more um, education from the private industry to to the um, the political climate to say here's what we need to move those renewable resources forward from an energy basis. And um, from our experience, we the the um, the uh, the public climate is, uh, excuse me, po political climate is open to helping and facilitating that. Another um, good resource we have that I think um, we um, overlook, at least right now, is we have three of the largest um, um, military bases in Nevada. And so we've got, and we have along with BLM land, and there's a lot of um, technologies that we can use and we can actually bring into the state based on those um, three particular um, Air Force bases that I think will be. Um, Actually, not all Air Force bases, military bases, that would be very helpful as well too. And then it was mentioned earlier the amount of BLM land that we have. I think in terms of solar fields and solar plants, I think that's something that, um, and I'm sure Envy Energy can speak even more um, in depth to that. Is something that we can look at. And, and all, right now, um, just even you know, it, since we're so um, strong in the solar in terms of the sun and, and we might want to look at maybe possibly exporting that as an energy and creating a resource here. Right now it's yeah, not permitted but I'm sure that uh, pretty soon we'll be able to again like I said I won't give a, um, a detailed analysis on how, how that works but we'll be able to hopefully export some of our renewable energy here whether it's through geothermal or wind or solar. So Michael, you want to just follow one, up on that yeah, too? Just one yeah. quick comment yeah. uh, so that everybody knows. Yeah. This state is number one in the United States in terms of, of solar and geothermal per capita. Yeah. And, and while we don't have a lot of capitas in this state, if you take <laughs> away the fact that we're a small state, we're number two in the United States in geothermal and number three in the United States in solar. And that's our company relative to companies in California that are about three, three and a half times our size. So we've done a lot. In, in terms of, of renewable energy, but there's a lot more to do. One of the ways to do that is a transmission line that we're just starting to build now that we've been talking about for about 10 years and finally is coming into fruition. Where it will interconnect the northern and southern electrical systems in the state, which has never been the case. That means we can't share the generating resources in the state and we can't develop the plentiful geothermal resources that are in the northern portion of the state which is the best kind of resource that we can have because it doesn't count on the sun shining or the wind blowing in order for it to be producing. So this is something that is real. It's going to continue to increase the amount of renewable energy in our state and the best kind of renewable energy in terms of cost and reliability is geothermal. And we have more geothermal yet to be developed in this state, and I'm talking about overall in terms of, of uh, megawatts, than any other state in the United States. So we've got a lot going for us here in renewable energy, mm -hmm. and I think we're gonna see more and more of that as time goes on. Uh, well, Steve, I'd like to just pick up on, on those comments and, and get to a point that you had raised earlier, and that is kind of where do we go, uh, where do we go from here? You made the point that we need to uh, identify, kind of do an inventory of the real assets that we have. I think that's uh, especially critical uh, in any uh, any time, but especially now when it comes to uh, economic development and diversification, because every state in America, I think, 
uh, uh, is doing some form of economic development and diversification, and, and a lot of countries are doing it. So it is a very, very uh, broad uh, subject, and I think we need to focus our efforts and understanding what we have, where we have a, a clear comparative advantage. Uh, and then uh, one, one of our former presidents, going back uh, many years here at this university, used to talk about uh, watering the green spots. I think, first of all, we have to identify the green spots in this state, and then we have to find a way to foster the development of those things with a very focused strategy to make sure that we, we know what we need to do, get public policy support, uh, whether it's at the state level or at the federal level. And, and, and we have some assets. The things that we're talking about right now in terms of renewables, it is a natural uh, thing for uh, us to, to, to focus on, but we've got to have a very clear focused strategy, and I sense more uh, today than ever uh, that we're, we're close to being uh, uh, able to, to have a real uh, a focus in that particular area. The federal assets in general, the things that uh, Michelle talked about in terms of the, uh, the military uh, facilities that we have here, I don't know if Troy Wade is still uh, here in the audience, but uh, there he is, uh, uh, but uh, uh, Troy, who spent a lot of his entire career uh, 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 working with our, our military, uh, our, our federal assets here like uh, the nuclear test site and uh, and has a, cl a clear understanding of Yucca Mountain there are things that we can do with those assets the BLM uh, 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 the amount of property that we have in BLM finding a way to to focus on those things uh, to uh, identify those things like switch communications that somebody mentioned earlier that give us a, 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 a very clear advantage in certain aspects of technology not the whole broad field of technology but I think that's we need to identify what the real strengths of this uh, uh, place are, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we're, the, the fact that we have a strength in tourism and in, in gaming, but finding ways to translate that into, uh, uh, into other things, the convention business that someone talked about, we have a tremendous flow of people here finding ways to leverage that. But that's where I think the focus uh, of our efforts need to be to create the focus of where development needs to be focused. Be placed. Thanks. We've got about five minutes left. I'm going to start with Ted at this end, and we're going to move right back down the table. If you take about 30 seconds, and if you've got one suggestion for us, one thing that we ought to remember, one thing that we ought to do right now, that goes for all seven of you, please let us know. Time's short. Yeah, I mentioned the concept of the consensus vision and, and folks having to give in a little bit uh, in terms of their particular agenda. I think the comment that was just made here is, is perfect. It starts with an asset inventory, a data-focused analysis that people can't argue with, and then it's a matter of uh, how you're going to utilize those assets on the consensus vision. And so there are, you know, some some great uh, you know consultants and people that can help you with those kind of asset inventories from an objective basis. Thanks. You've got green spots to work with. That's a nice uh, analogy. You've got a brand. Uh, when I travel internationally and mention that I'm from Dallas or the Dallas Fort Worth area, you know, some people kind of know where that is. Maybe maybe they know where Texas is. If I bet you, if I were to say was from Las Vegas, they'd know immediately where I was from. So you've got, uh, unusual for a metro area this size, you've got a tremendous brand in the, in the U.S., of course, but internationally as well, to build on. You've got a great airport, uh, top 10 airport, as I understand, in terms of uh, all the, the various statistics. You're close to California, you're close to the Asian markets, new airplanes are coming online. Uh, that might present some tremendous opportunities. And you're also a global leader in at least two sectors, uh, from my limited knowledge of Las Vegas and Nevada, uh, the gaming and the, uh, and the hosting, the convention sectors. What other tangential industries and sectors are part of that that you could corral? What are the three or four combinations of forces that are coming in those sectors that might yield a fifth or sixth or seventh next big thing that relates, like we were talking about uh, the video and new technologies, what relates to those things where you have an edge in walking in and selling to corporations and bringing them here that I wouldn't have in Dallas or that Denver wouldn't have. Find those couple of things uh, that are strengths, work on just a couple of weaknesses, start there and move forward. Tom? There's probably nothing more difficult than a start. Uh, and I, I sense today that today's the start. Uh, as you begin this journey, don't forget that we all need you too. Uh, your success is important to us in Colorado. We are a region with very, two, very few electoral votes. When cash gets passed out of Washington to make big things happen, 
we all need each other. If we can all speak with a common voice, put our delegations together when opportunity comes, we have huge common interest here. Somebody's got to figure out how to move all this alternative en energy to a state that's very hungry for it. That doesn't mean running a bunch of extension cords out to solar fields and wind farms. It means putting a grid together and figuring out how we pay for it and can price competitively to deliver it. That's, that's really hard, big thinking. Start small and let's grow into a big intermountain partnership. Thanks. Todd, it's up to you what you say, but if you say let's build I-11, I'd be happy with that. <laughs> okay, well, let's build I-11, but uh, in addition, let me just uh, echo what, what Tom just said on a regional basis. As we looked at the, uh, the grid in the AZ Smart example in my presentation, you can see that the grid was built around fossil fuel and traditional energy sources. It's not built around renewable energy sources and how we get that energy to the market. We've got to work together to make sure that this region grows together, and that's why I say we need each other. Our colleague of mine at Purdue says that uh, he's pushing the concept of strategic doing instead of strategic planning. Uh, and, and the concept is that you need to do all the things you, we've talked about here. You need to take an assessment of where your strengths are and where you should go. But the reason why I said just do it is that half the time a bad decision is better than no decision. There's some right in every bad decision normally. You've got to, once you find out what it is that you think you should be doing, do it get out there because you don't have as much time as you think. Other states are doing the same thing you're doing here. Other states are ahead of you. Uh, you've got to get off the dime with the best thoughts that you have as quickly as you can, as organized as you can, use the university str strengths that you d have to get to market as quickly as you can and hopefully on a regional basis because I'd love to do business with you. Michael? Uh, not a lot to add, but I'd, I'd say that again and going back to the strategic planning or doing analogy, Many times um, companies believe that they can do more than they're really capable of, what their core competencies are. And I think it's important for us to recognize what we really can do well and what we really, or how we really can differentiate ourselves. And that can't be more than five things in reality. Probably three to five things. I think the three that Don mentioned, the assets that we have here, we can capitalize on. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way, I mean in a, in a constructive and positive way. But we have to be real about what it is that we can do well. Because if we look at the region, the region has different strengths. Every state has different strengths. Every straight state has different assets. We have to figure out why would somebody want to move here and focus on that. I'm just going to pick up on that thought too. I mean, the, the focus on our comparative advantages is, is really important, uh, is really critical. The long-term visioning, uh, uh, the, 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 if you haven't read this document that came out of uh, Senator Horsford's group, uh, the Vision Stakeholders Group, if you do nothing other than read the, uh, the summary of it, it gives you a, an incredibly good sense of a, a picture of what we need to do. And, 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 and now we need to get just do it. I think I, I really like that comment about just, uh, uh, just do it. The planning is the easy part. It wasn't real easy as we went through that, but the planning really is the easy part compared to the doing, and we just have to get to the uh, doing stage. And the final comment I will make is, uh, and it's not because I've not, I'm now almost seven months into my university career, but I really liked uh, hearing what I uh, what we heard, particularly from uh, 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 Ted and Todd, with regard to the role that uh, higher education has to play in this uh, in in this process. Uh, and also the, the interdisciplinary uh, uh, concepts that were discussed, something that, Neil, you talk a lot about here at the university. It's absolutely critical. So, so I, I, liked, I like what, I, what we've heard today. We just have to get to the point now of, uh, of action. Michelle? Um, I guess I'd like to end more on a, I've, this has just been amazing um, to hear everyone's ideas and ha how we could, what resources we have, what business strategy we have, but really our biggest and best resource I'll speak in terms of this room, is you. And the question is, how do you stay motivated? And like Nietzsche said, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So we're all here, we're all alive, and we all can become stronger from, from where we are today to moving to the future. And, and one of the things, especially when people go through a, a distressed period of time, they have a tendency to focus on, well, this is wrong and that's wrong, and this is you know, what, you know, what we need to fix. You know, I think we need to all start looking forward and, and, and stop kind of focusing on where we are, but really focus on uh, where you want to be. And, 
and um, necessity really is the mother of invention and we are in a, in a time where I think if we play our cards right in 20 years we're going to be in a pretty amazing spot and I think everyone has to look forward and, and keep that vision whether it's for the state but even for yourself I mean I know a lot of businesses are getting um, hit pretty hard and you you have to re just really just buckle down and know that things will get better and keep using your innovative creative energy and try to be agile but if you think you're stuck, you'll be stuck. So don't think that way. Think forward. And um, thank you guys for your interest in, in listening to everybody. Uh, Phil Satry used a comment to pick up on what Michelle said when he said, said we have to regain our confidence. We really have to get our swagger back. It felt really good uh, when we were cooking as an, uh, as an economy. Swagger right now. We're out of time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Phil. Steve, for sure. Thank you. That was a great, great panel. Thank you all so much.